Hello everyone. Uh, this time around I want to talk a little bit about the problems with software development these days. Now I'm not talking about the software that's on your uh, desktop computer necessarily. So I'm not necessarily uh, talking specifically about things like Microsoft Word or uh, or LibreOffice or uh, other big software packages that you might might use or might have used in the past. What I, I'm really talking about is the software in, in things, the embedded software that makes things work. And you'd be surprised where there is software in the widgets that you have. Pretty much nobody would be surprised to find out that there's software in their smartphone uh, or in their tablet or in their car running the infotainment system. But you might be surprised to learn that there's software, non-trivial software in a lot of cases, in ordinary appliances like uh, washing machines and uh, stoves and refrigerators and uh, things where you wouldn't expect software to be necessary. And you'll, you'll also find non-trivial software in, in situations where you would think trivial software would be sufficient. Uh, you know, tr by, and by trivial software, I mean software that uh, a person knowledgeable person can look at the software, like the source code for the software, and understand it and be able to demonstrate that it's correct. Instead, we have uh, a lot of products where someone has just taken some off-the-shelf, massively overcomplicated computer-on-a-chip thing, shoved it in their product, and then set it to doing something trivial like displaying the time. Uh, you, you, you do see that sort of thing coming up. And we're starting to see things like um, smart light bulbs and nonsense like that, where you've got you know, software that connects to the internet, or can connect to the internet in there. Now, while devices running software were generally standalone and not connected to anything, it, it didn't really matter... Uh, how good quality the software was, as long as it actually functioned. And when it failed, it failed infrequently, and you just power cycle the widget and everything's good. But these days, there's a move to connect everything to the Internet. Uh, there's even a buzzword for it, Internet of Things. And you got to wonder about the, the sanity of that given that we can't seem to manage the security of the software on devices that already need to be connected to the internet to do their job. Why you need to connect a light bulb to the internet is beyond me. Um, you don't need any remote telemetry from a light bulb. Uh, like, like what, what good's it going to do? The, if you need some smarts with the light, that should be in the fixture, not the light bulb. Uh, and even then, it's dubious whether a light fixture of any sort really needs to be connected to the internet at large. It doesn't. Now, there are cases where it can be useful for remote control type applications or what have you where... Uh, where stuff sh would need to be connected to some sort of a network. But that is not the normal case, and we shouldn't be pushing for people to be uh, having stuff that's connected to the Internet by default. Some of the canonical examples, the Internet of Things, is a refrigerator being able to uh, reorder uh, stuff when it's out because you took the last of the item out of the refrigerator. Well, that's of dubious utility, really, when you get down to it. And there's a lot of other things that people have suggested should be connected to the Internet of Things, which have even less logic behind them. But let's leave aside the, the concept that 
uh, whether it's uh, sensible or not, to connect stuff to the Internet of Things or the Internet. Let's just kill the buzzword and, uh, you know, just connect it to the Internet. Well, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. Is there, there will be devices where it makes some sense to connect them, even if, there are, if the majority of devices it makes no sense. Now, recently, there was a massive denial of service attack against a huge uh, service provider on the internet. And that actually knocked a lot of stuff offline for hours. And it was, it's at least been reported that the vast majority of the traffic that was coming in there and causing them problems was coming from compromised Internet of Things devices. That is, it wasn't traffic that was spoofed with, with a fake source address. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't compromised web servers or websites. It, it, it wasn't desktop machines that had been compromised by some idiot clicking on that naked lady picture that he got in his email. It was these, the notionally, these light bulbs connected to the internet that were compromised and being used as, a, a, you know, as, as an army to send useless traffic at the target of the attack. And that leaves you wondering, why was it even vulnerable to that? Like, why was it possible? Uh, on such a scale? Well, there's, there's a few issues that the network operations has issues because we're expecting the average uh, Joe who knows nothing about networking to secure his network. And, and we should not be expecting that any more than we expect a non-mechanic to be able to change the oil in their car. It doesn't make any sense, but we haven't got the stuff, the, the stuff to a maturity level where we've got people actually getting in experts to sort it out and we're also not to the point where we're forcing the stuff to be secure by default instead of, or at least reasonably secure by default, instead of wide open by default. Because people don't want secure by default because it's hard to use or harder to use. They want easy to use. They want to plug something in and have it just work. Leaving aside the network level security issues, which could have mitigated this, but they wouldn't have stopped it. You have to look at how the software in these devices is developed. Now, the economics here is all back to front uh, to what we actually need for things to be cleaned up. The actual cost of fixing things is high, and it would have to be borne by the manufacturers of these devices. But the, if one manufacturer chooses to ignore the bit about being a good citizen and make sure that their stuff is clean uh, you, you know uh, and instead they just go and you know, develop things as cheaply as possible with the cheapest crap possible with no concern for even functionality let alone security well they're going to undercut everybody else and as a result, they're going to get the market share and everybody else is going to lose their shirt or they're going to have to join the race to the bottom. And so the economics are against doing the right thing. And there's no way we can change that. The, the economics are always going to be against doing the right thing unless there's some other uh, uh, force that raises the bar where the bottom is, the bottom that everyone races to. And this is where we've got regulations in a lot of industries to prevent the bottom from being dangerously low. There's regulations all over the car industry, for instance, the automotive industry, to uh, require safety features and so on in, uh, in cars. And because everybody has to abide by those same rules, then there's, there isn't an economic incentive to uh, break them because they are enforced, at least to some extent. Now, obviously, there is imperfections in that, but 
it's, it's starting to look like we're going to have to have some level of regulation for the software development in widgets. And that uh, regulation is going to have to force the manufacturers to fix problems after they've sold the device. Now, generally, regulations, all they do is increase the cost of everything, and everybody is generally against regulating things uh, because it will cost money. Your Internet of Things devices will get much more expensive if the manufacturers are required to build their software properly. And, you know, that's probably not a bad thing because the cost of the bad software that's in these things now is borne by the Internet at large and the targets of these attacks, which is not the manufacturer of the devices, nor is it the consumer of the devices. So neither the consumer nor the manufacturer has an economic incentive to insist on the stuff being fixed. So how do you fix the software development? You know, you need to know that before you can regulate it. Well, we do know how to write proper, good software uh, with a very low incidence of bugs and other issues. Uh, but it's very, 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 insert a few thousand more of those in there, expensive. Um, it requires certain software development practices that uh, you know would, would give uh, academics uh, a hard on uh, because it's the kind of thing they teach in software development courses, which has absolutely no relation to the way the world actually works. So, uh, what what needs to happen is every single bit of code has to be reviewed. In context, it has to be tested, it has to be uh, examined every which way anyone can think of, and no line of code gets changed or added or removed without first having a paper trail of some kind, and by paper trail I mean records, not necessarily physical paper. But there has to be, somebody had to sign off on it, more than one person had to sign off on it, it had to be uh, carefully examined, it had to be explained why it was needed, what it was supposed to do, and everything has to be tested. So you have to make sure that just like you test the physical hardware in your widget when you're making the widget, the software has to be tested carefully to make sure that uh, things that it could experience don't break it. Now, most testing will test to see if the thing works under proper conditions with proper inputs. This is where a lot of software development goes wrong. What you need to do to uh, minimize the chance of these issues is to test things with inputs and circumstances that are not proper. If, you know, that you, someone's putting some random junk on the wire and the device gets it, make sure it doesn't misbehave. Make sure it doesn't give access to things it shouldn't. Uh, and that's, that's uh, important. And that's the biggest thing you need from a security standpoint. You need to test inputs that are not proper, that are malformed. And you're going to miss some of them. It, it's going to happen. The more complicated your software is, the more complicated its interactions are, the more likely some of this stuff is going to get missed. And that's perfectly understandable. And that's why you need the next bit, which is to don't put anything, any feature in if it's not strictly required. Do not add features just because you can, and do not add any new features until the existing stuff is functioning properly. Uh, make sure everything works, Make sure you've tested everything every which way you can think of. Then you add a new feature, if it makes sense. And then you test that feature in combination with absolutely every other feature and setting you've got. You have to test 
every possible combination of settings, even the ones that cannot happen. Now, the reason you have to test things that cannot happen is just because your software is maybe provably correct, uh, although you can't prove software correct in a general case, in specific cases you can, that doesn't mean the hardware won't screw up. That doesn't mean that you won't have a bit flip in memory. It doesn't, you know, something like that. It doesn't mean that, that something won't happen, that the bad setting gets in there somehow anyway. So the software needs to do something when it encounters settings that don't make any sense. It needs to do something predictable and it needs to do something sensible. That may mean ignoring a particular setting or treating this impossible combination as another combination. It might mean uh, stopping and uh, and just stopping functioning. Uh, it, but whatever it does, it should do something that is fail secure and fail safe, not random. And by fail secure, I mean it doesn't, uh, it doesn't open things up to unauthenticated people that shouldn't have access to anything, to the stuff. And fail safe, I mean it shouldn't do something like explode in, in somebody's face. Now, you can't always make something completely fail-safe uh, or fail-secure, but you should do it as much as you possibly can. Now, leaving aside what you can do to develop a software in the first place, you also need to have some mechanism for updating it in the event that you did screw up with the software. Now, for a simple device that's not network connected, odds are, if it works, the software won't need to be updated. In that case, it can probably be burned into a ROM or something like that, and, and then it'll never need to be updated. And if there is a critical flaw in the software, you recall the product and you give people a new one. For stuff that's going to be, say, in the Internet of Things or whatever, you definitely have to have some mechanism for updating the software, and it needs to be a mechanism that cannot be triggered remotely. Uh, if it can be triggered remotely, invariably, at some point, the authentication mechanism for that update process will be cracked, and uh, and then some then random uh, bad actors will be able to install their own software updates and take over the device. And that's why you can't you shouldn't be allowing over-the-air, remotely initiated software updates. You, you can't be doing that. That's too dangerous. Even though a lot of stuff does that, it shouldn't. It's a bad idea. I know why uh, a lot of uh, operations do this, uh, and it's to avoid support issues, but it's a bad idea no matter what the device is, period shouldn't do it. And yes, I understand there are, there are cases where, say, a Tesla car has a fatal flaw in, in the software and it can be fixed by a software update. I can understand why Tesla would want to push that over the air. But it's still a bad idea to allow it to be initiated by a remote actor. It, it, the, the updates have to be initiated by the user of the device or possibly some uh, some scheme but the device has to initiate it to a known good location. That's still risky though because that known good location could be compromised as well and that is in fact the target for a lot of these uh, bad actors. They'll go for the update server not the devices themselves and if they do it right Nobody will ever be aware that the update server is compromised. But you also need to, uh, leaving aside how secure updates are, uh, it, it's something that has to be considered, and the trade-offs have to be considered uh, for the various things you can do. Leaving aside update mechanisms, you can have all of the update mechanisms in the world that are as you know bulletproof secure, and it doesn't do you any good if you don't ever release fixed software. So if the, the software for the device is broken uh, either by design or by accident, and you need, and say you for, for whatever reason, uh, it needs to be updated for the device to function. 
a story I, I just saw in a discussion online. A guy bought a television set and it had uh, some sort of fancy on-screen guide scheme that uh, needed proper local time, yet the time zone in the device was locked to Eastern Time, uh, North American Eastern Time, and could not be changed. That means that the device is actually non-functional for its stated purpose because the guide cannot be set to the proper time zone. The machine cannot operate in the proper time zone. But the guy that bought it, he contacted the manufacturer and the manufacturer basically told him to fuck off because the product wasn't being sold anymore even though he had just bought it. Sure, it might have been an end-of-life display model or something like that, but there was no software update and he was told they weren't going to do a software update for one guy. But he contacted them. What about the potentially thousands or tens of thousands of others that might have bought the same model that have the same problem that didn't contact them. So it's not necessarily just for one guy. But this under, underscores the really big problem in the industry these days, and that is products are they're still operating under the fire and forget product design model, which is fine when your product is a physical device that either works or it doesn't. But when you're selling smart devices that have complex software and they're basically computers, and you're putting crap, cheaply designed software on them from the start, so you know it's got to have bugs in it, it's going to have issues, and it probably needs uh, patching at some point. If you're going to do that, you need to make sure you have an update mechanism, and you need to make sure that you make the updates. Now this is a big problem, not just for this particular model of smart TV, which, uh, you know, this poor sucker bought. Uh, and this was a big corporation that made it, a big name corporation, and they basically told them to fuck off. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it applies to everything, including cell phones. Um, you know, Google is releasing updates to the Android, base Android system, all of the time. There, there are updates coming regularly. But... They, 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 they're not available for most users of most devices because the carrier or the manufacturer doesn't make the, their customized crapware avail <clears throat> available with the updated underlying software. Oh, they'll provide the updates for the first six months or something like that. But these devices could easily last for four or five or six years. And the bad actors don't stop trying to compromise them just because there's a new model released with new software. They, in fact, will target the old ones because they aren't getting updates, even when updates are available. So this is where we really uh, come down to the toss-up, like regulation generally isn't the best thing in the world because it's usually not the right regulation. Uh, but how else do we get these, these uh, widget makers and widget purveyors to release updates when they're necessary? After the first sale, they have no economic incentive to do it. They've already got the money. They don't have any need to do anything else to keep the money. And that's a problem. And it's a massive cost center for them to release off software updates for every product they ever released, that they ever put out there, uh, or any current product even. So they just don't. And you see that with the router boxes that people buy for their house. Um, there may be updates to, for the firmware in them for a year or so, but usually, after that, you can't find an update to save your life. So, uh, what do we really need here to solve the problem? Well, ideally we need a cultural shift where uh, people will uh, move toward 
behavior that's better for society at large, but that's not going to happen in the general case. Uh, it's just not going to happen. There's an economic disincentive for that. So it's not going to happen. Companies are not going to suddenly start releasing updates to their products on an ongoing basis for old products. There's an economic disincentive for that. They're, they're not going to start developing software with proper software development methodologies and careful analysis and testing. There's an economic disincentive for doing that. So basically, everything that we need to fix the problems has massive economic disincentives. So it's not going to happen on its own. It just isn't. Uh, with the disincentives, the economic disincentives, it can't happen on its own. Or at least it would need a massively special set of circumstances. So I think what we need is regulation that requires that if you sell a device with firmware in it, that if there are problems discovered with it during its useful life, and that is does not include just the warranty period, it can't, uh, the warranty period is usually way too short is, is compared to the actual useful life of the product. And uh, you know, so we need to make sure that as long as the product is being sold, there must there must be maintenance on the firmware. Now, if the firmware is correct and doesn't have problems, this will be cheap because there won't need to be any updates. Or if the device functions properly and it can't be connected to a network, it can't actually have issues, then yeah, it, again, it's probably cheap. It won't impact standalone devices all that much because there won't be any, any risk, really. Any more than you'd have to have already, because for the standalone device, if the firmware breaks, the device breaks, then you might have to replace some. Okay, so those ones are not a big issue, but for Internet of Things type devices, or, or, or smartphones, or router boxes, or desktop PCs, it... Uh, we need to have, as long as the technology is being produced and sold, then it has to be supported. Uh, any Im embedded firmware has to be maintained, and new versions have to be provided at no charge. If that was the case we suddenly start seeing a lot more devices that don't have useless features in them. Uh, we see a lot more devices with firmware that's been tested properly. And we'd also see a smaller number of models. Well, we'd see a set of devices from a company and you won't get a new model every five minutes because they have to maintain their software. And you also have to figure that as long as the devices, say the 70% of the devices or even 40% of devices are likely to still be functional, you do kind of need to force these people, these manufacturers to support their devices. And if you've got cases like cell phones where the software is customized by the carriers, you're going to have to start requiring the, the carriers or whoever's customizing the stuff to support their customizations for the same type of time frame. And that, again, will, be, will make a disincentive to make this customized crapware. So I think overall... If we can get some relatively straightforward regulation in place where if you're selling widgets with firmware that, you know, any kind of software in it, you have to maintain that software and you have to update it if flaws are found. If we do that, 
then I think we've got a much better chance of getting handle on the mess that we're currently in. Because it means that if everybody has to do this, then you've raised the floor for the race to the bottom. And everybody will generally feel better about it because while it's painful for them, they know that their competitors have to do the same thing. Unfortunately, this is going to raise the price of products. That's unavoidable. But right now, the products, like the what we're paying for a lot of this crap stuff that's out there, these Internet of Things junkware, uh, is nowhere near the actual cost of of, of um, building them and using them uh, because, hey, they're getting compromised and attacking major in internet infrastructure providers. And that affects everybody. So the people using these products should be paying for the cost of developing them properly. That's just the way it works. And if it comes down that it's too expensive to develop these products and then sell them, then the products themselves will go away. And that is also a potentially desirable outcome because it gets the crap out of there. Now, unfortunately, the crap that's already out there, it's not going away. But if we can stop adding more crap out there, eventually this stuff will, the, the crap that's out there now, will disappear through attrition and the overall problems it causes will drop off over time. And that's really what we want to go for. Anyway, I think I've rambled on long enough here. It's uh, gone on longer than I actually intended to. So I'll leave it here. If you want to be notified of future videos, make sure to subscribe. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.